The Secrets of Star Trek is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, episode 130. Captain DeBridge. Spock here. Make it so. Surrender is not an option. Attention crew of the Enterprise, this is James Kirk. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the Discovery episode, Unification 3. Joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Steger. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going? Very well, thanks. And Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Don. Uh, Folks, remember to like The Secrets of Star Trek on Facebook, where we're at facebook.com slash starquestmedia, and retweet us on Twitter, where we're at SQPN, and leave us comments in all places where you find us on social media. We really love to hear from you. I also want to let you know that we have uh, some feedback, listener feedback on our most recent episodes at the end of the uh, this episode. So be sure to stick around for that. So we are talking about Unification 3. I have to say right off the bat, I think this is better than the most recent several episodes. This is, I think, back mm. to a higher mm-hmm. level for me. What do you, really? what do you guys think? Yeah. I, I, I'm kind of a yes or no on that. There, there's parts of this episode I like, uh, especially the, the, the concept of that, yes, the Vulcans have, and Vulcans and Romulans have reunited, uh, and, the, you know, the completion of Spock's work and all that, I think, was good. We have our Mary Sue involved, though. The we original Mary Sue of the episode. Three Mary Sues. Three, okay. Yeah. So we have yeah. Adira. Right. Burnham. And Michael. Yep. And Tilly. She's now Tilly Sue. Oh, Tilly Sue. Right, right. She's she was Tilly was always on the edge of being a Mary Sue, but this she official this episode she officially crosses the line. Yeah, I, I will share with you my my uh, message to Father Corey uh, when I encountered that yeah. a, this particular moment. When we oh, get yes. to that moment, uh, I, I will share with you what I said to Father Corey because and, and agreed, <laughs> and I figured it out right away exactly which epi- which scene it was too. So, yeah. but we'll get there. Uh, I do want to so start by talking about you know, we start once again with someone uh, someone's personal log or someone's log, a captain's log, mm-hmm. personal log. So we have Burnham's personal log where she's and she's having a career crisis. Yeah. Dear diary, I don't fit in. It's like it sounds like something yeah. like a high school kid would be writing. You know, I don't feel like I fit in anymore. And so this is the whole she may be leaving Discovery thing. Now, mm-hmm. we had talked about before how it felt like they were setting up Burnham to to be leaving. And they so right. they really paid it off here in this episode. They really this is their definitive like boom. Okay, they, we're addressing that now, and I'm glad they didn't Which drag that out. Yeah, and it, I mean, I even looked in the trailer, at least to me, that this episode was going to be when she leaves the ship. But yeah, they they left know, it that, out there again. They paid that off, you know, and they paid it off, and I I think is a good way. Other than I, I think we'd like to see the character disappear for a while, but. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, like, I mean, yeah. I don't want her to disappear. I want her to be better written. Right, yeah. right. That's about uh, it. Uh, she and Book are full on in relationship mode now. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, over some pillow talk, he he tells her that um, he and Spock, her her brother. Okay, we're reminding everyone that Spock is her brother. Would have bonded over Michael's messianic complex, her need to take responsibility for everything. And I like that they point that out as well. Like this is mm-hmm. this is. Both a strength and a flaw in Burnham. In fact, it, it, the flaw may outweigh the strength aspect of it. Uh, you, you, you can do good things without having a messianic complex, which she has. Well, it's interesting that they, they point that out to immediately then play on it. Yes. In this episode. Right. I think they think of it as a more of a strength than a weakness. Uh, but I think it's the, the reverse. It's, it's part of the classic set of criteria you need for a Mary Sue. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you have a overachiever mm-hmm. on multiple fronts. That's one element of the Mary Sue paradigm. Another right. is tragic flaw or vulnerability. 
you know, tr- the tragic flaw that leads to emotional vulnerability. Right. Right. And then the third is unjustified adulation. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. You're the best. Thank you for be- Captain Kirk says you, the, you're the reason we're the best ship in Starfleet. <laughs> I mean, that's classic. Like the original yeah. Mary yeah. Sue. Yeah. Uh, so then Tilly, uh, we have the, the confrontation between Tilly and Michael where Tilly and tells her off that. Yeah. yeah, I like that. She does it in a pretty low key way, but she she puts the smack down on Michael. Yes, mm-hmm. you put me in a difficult position by not telling me. And Michael's like, it was for your own good. I always hate that when the characters say that. I did I did this awful thing to you for your own good. And Tilly's like, look, that was my decision. That like, you shouldn't have done it. Yeah. Made the decision for me. That's for me to decide. Uh, so they're they're this is in the context of them working on this problem of the black boxes and the timing of the burn. Uh, and did you guys catch the meant the uh, oh yeah the mention of the yep. Elchin, another yeah. homage yep. to a Star Trek actor who's left us who's died. And it in the context of a ship blowing up, it seemed a little dodgy to me. Yeah, given how Anton Yelchin died. Yeah, he died in a car accident. Yeah, that, that, that could be a commentary on the, the Kelvin movies too, though the existence of the Kelvin movies too. So, so in case uh, in, in, if you're a, a fan who's listening who's not re- doesn't remember, Anton Yelchin played Chekhov in the in the Kelvin, the J.J. Abrams Star Trek movies. You know, Chris Pine as Kirk movies and he died tragically in a car accident his car car rolled into him i think a car uh, got loose and rolled into yeah. him and crashed at him. his house at his house yeah it was terrible um just me rest in peace uh so uh, but in the so in the show the tilly has found out that there was a time variance in the explosions of the ships during the burn but i like this because because burnham said had been looking for three ships so we can triangulate and tilly points out no, no, we're talking in three dimensional space here. You need four right. or more. So you, you've got a, you've got a point, but that point goes infinite in either direction as space goes infinite in either direction. Right. So you can fly along that line till eternity and not <laughs> yes. find the spot. So that's why you need a fourth a fourth data point at least to to get to really uh, lock down the location. So I, I, I'm glad they 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 also pointed out that er, that flaw. Um, now we get introduced to this. Data. There's not the character. There, there is more data <laughs> available from this experiment called SB19, but they can't access it because it's Vulcan, and the Vulcans are not in the Federation. Right. They've also That's renamed, impossible. Yeah, <laughs> they've renamed their planet. It's now called Nivar, and they are living there with Romulans who apparently have all relocated to well, Vulcan, even though Romulus w- had a star empire. So even if you took out the core solar system, they should still be uh, all over the place elsewhere in their empire. Well, the, in the events of the Picard uh, la- the Last Hope, Last Best Hope book, yeah. um, the star wasn't going to just take out the solar system for for whatever reason reasons. It was taking out like like a huge chunk of the empire somehow. Yeah, it didn't make any sense. That didn't make any sense. No, <laughs> but but yeah, we'll we'll just go. I mean, what it is doing is is it's it is building off of that whole Romulans as refugees thing yeah. that that the Picard series did. Even though it was still several centuries after the the actual events of Romulus blowing up, right? It was but, still quite a time after that. They said something like. I can't remember how how long they said, but they said like 500 years or something like that after Spock before they finally reunited. And they do make it clear that the folks on Discovery come from a time before anybody knew that Romulans and Vulcans were the same species, that they were related. Right. Yep. Uh, Yeah. That's good. Um, And it was Spock's efforts at unification that brought about the this and that. And Michael has a a nice moment where she realizes it's her brother who accomplished this this goal. He, He became a great person and. And they show us footage of Spock from the original Unification Part 1, Part 2 yep. stories in Next Gen, which would confirm, despite the speculation of some fans, that the Discovery did not jump to the Kelvin timeline. This is prime timeline. Yes, yes. Absolutely. I mean, because uh, that event wouldn't have happened that way in Kelvin timeline. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are told that the that Navarre left the Federation a century prior to the events here, so uh, right around the burn, and right I after and I, the burn, yeah. right after it, and I like the fact that the Romulans wanted to stay in the Federation. Yes, that's, that's a nice touch. Yes, yep. yeah. 
So that was when they left. That was a big burn. Uh, I like <laughs> burn. Oh. Yeah. One thing I want to point out. So this is a when the opening title sequence. This is the, that was the teaser before the uh, the opening title sequence. I, I, I don't know if I've mentioned before. I really like how during the opening titles, I watched this one with the subtitles on because of, I wanted mm-hmm. to make sure I caught all the very the subtleties um, of the of what's going on in the in this in the episode. I like how during the, the, the opening titles, the subtitles specifically note, this is the original Alexander Carge theme music. Like, you know, the, mm-hmm. yeah. they have like a like a, a, a quarter note on the screen for most of it. And then uh, the original episode, original series real Star theme Trek, music no, plays. Real Star theme. Yeah. 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 This got it right at the very end where they got the little, little Flourish. riff there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I that specifically. That's it's, cool. it's a little bit, a, a little bit of a, a thing that, that, you, that I like. Uh, so, it turns out SB19 was, I don't know why they call it SB19. It's just, a, it's sort of a weird, like, I don't know. Random mm. experiment designation. Yeah. It was research into instantaneous travel akin to the spore drive. The the Vulcans had decided we need to stop doing this. It's too dangerous. As, as a dilithium alternative, because right, right. even before the burn, dilithium was in short supply because the Federation was overextending itself. Right. right. And because they and, were desperate for dilithium, they the, the, the that's the disagreement caused the Vulcans to leave over the what, one of, well one of they it was it, the the Vulcans felt that the Federation was prioritizing certain worlds over others mm-hmm. uh, in terms of dilithium allocation and then the SB nineteen experiment happened and the burn happened simultaneously it seemed Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. so the vulcans believed that the federation forced them to cause the burn right which hurt everybody and so they're deeply ashamed of having caused the burn they think and deeply resentful of the federation for making them do it and consequently that's why they left even though the romulans wanted them to stay and I, I like the fact that the Admiral actually pointed that out. It's not that they caused the burn. The, 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 the Vulcans weren't upset because they caused the burn. They think they caused the burn, but because the Federation forced them to be in that situation where they caused the burn. Right, right. And it's interesting that Burnham is convinced from the start that I, I have discovered the evidence. This I, the person mm-hmm. a thousand years out of time, have discovered as evidence where you have not. Uh, and I am going yeah. to correct you all. And she gets well, she gets called up on that by the end of this. She's, yeah. She's, well, and it's what's one note I wrote down is why do they think discovery and of course by extension Michael Burnham right. has to be the one to solve this? And I'm, I'm sure even though the Federation is a shell of its former self, I'm sure they still have people trying to figure this stuff out. Mm-hmm. Burnham can't be the first person in 120 years to actually sit down and try to figure all this out. Right now, another interesting aspect here. So Vance sees the opportunity here i've got spock's sister we this could help us reopen diplomatic relations with navarre and then she's like i can't fairly represent the federation right now because i've i've done a bad thing and he's like yeah you're going anyway because <laughs> that's orders mm-hmm. and and mm-hmm. i was thinking the episode title here so the episode title on the surface is we had unification one and two where the two parts of the TNG story where Spock was trying to unify the Vulcans and the Romulans. But I'm wondering if there's another layer to it where we're also going to see three kinds of unifications in this episode where mm-hmm. we're going to attempt to reunify Vulcan and the Federation. Mm-hmm. We're going to attempt to reunify uh, Burnham and her mother, bring them together again. And then the mm-hmm. third one, the third uni- reunification is Burnham and Discovery, the crew. There's these three if that, if, layers. If that gets you through the night, that's just fine. I, <laughs> to, to me, to me, this is the sequel to Unification Part 2. Now, this, yeah. is, this is my YouTube video that I'm going to put out that's going to be all clickbaity. The, the, uh-huh. hidden, the hidden meaning behind Unification 3. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> all the Easter eggs. Oh, yes. All the Easter eggs that you missed. That and, you missed. And only I know. And you'll have to watch, give me clicks in order to get it. Uh, so now, okay. Here's, here's the worst part of this episode. Saru needs a first officer. So does he go to his highly qualified uh, con officer in Oa? 
No. Does he go to the third mate who has been on the bridge and has taken the con when Saru and Burnham have been off the ship? No. Who does he go to? The most junior officer on the ship and ask her to be first officer. The, the one who literally a year ago was still a cadet. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, a thousand years ago, but a year oh, ago. Yes. It is so ridiculous. She doesn't have the rank to serve yes. a, as a first officer. And let's promote the ensign to fir- in any real world scenario. Right. Mm-hmm. Let's promote the ensign to first officer is not going he has this baloney explanation about well unlike other people you seem to be adapting and i want you to help them to adapt to our new situation it's like no promoting the ensign to xo is not going to help people adapt it is going to generate massive resentment right and insubordination and charges of delinquency on the part of the captain (laughs) now right uh, imagine if you will captain picard Riker has been promoted to his own ship and he's off on his own. And Picard has to find a new first officer. And so he goes down to Wesley and says, Wesley, will you guide my slate tonight? I mean, like, come on. I mean, it's 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 so ridiculous because, I mean, just let's let's put the obvious thing out there. You are going to and Stamets Stamets kind of kind of hints at this, but you're going to have the obvious thing of. Okay, this person is giving me an order as XO, but this person is also an ensign. And rank matters as much as office. Right. That when a superior officer, as in rank, gives you an order, you have to listen to it. Same thing if, you know, your executive officer listens to it. That is going to be a huge, in the real world, that's going to be a huge conflict. Of course, Wonderland of Discovery is probably going to work out just fine. It's probably going to be the best thing ever. But, I mean, how many commanders do they have on the ship? How many lieutenant commanders? Because you could, I could see... Somebody like a lieutenant commander, which is two steps down from captain, right? Being put in that position temporarily. That works. Matter of fact, that happened on TNG when uh, I just saw the episode where they had the uh, the, when the da- war Riker games. And da- Riker and Data are off the ship. Worf gets it, right? Yeah. Well, there's the episode where Data is acting first officer because Riker is commanding another ship on these war games, the, these mm-hmm. these right. s- simulations. You know, that's fine, but. Going all the way down to the Ensign. most junior officer. And of course, everybody's, oh, it's so wonderful. Say yes, say yes, say yes. Like, oh. give me a break. It's like, I was like, I was watching the love boat. You know, I mean, this is this a, 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 a an advanced, you know, ship of science and exploration and war? Because it is. Or is this a cruise ship? I mean, come on. Yeah. yeah that- Even on a cruise ship, this would not work. <laughs> <laughs> you would you would go down to the mess cook and say, "Hey, now you're now the XO of the cruise ship." Hey, Captain Steuben goes down to, to I forget the names of the char- characters on Love Boat, but you know, yeah, this is the part where I sent Father Corey a, a note. Can you can you guess which part of the episode I'm at where I just said you can't do that? Because <laughs> <laughs> Father Corey, be, having being a veteran, having served, you know exactly. <laughs> and that, that's yeah. that's where I immediately responded. I responded back. Let, let me guess the the, the part where. Uh, Saru wants Tilly be the XO. <laughs> yes, yes. All right, so let's move past that part to the rest of the story. They're, uh, they're, they arrive at Navarre instantaneously. They do, you know, a spore drive jump, of course. Uh, and it raises some, uh, some of those characteristic Vulcan eyebrows that how did you manage to get past our sensors, long-range sensors? Uh, you've developed a way of traveling instantaneously that we were trying to develop 100 years ago. Or similar to what? They yep. were trying to develop. Right, right. Uh, the president of Vulcan, uh, she, they, she agrees. Trina. To, yes. I Trina. mean, Tarina. <laughs> gotta say it the Vulcan way. Yeah, yes. Uh, Trina. <laughs> um, <laughs> she has this line where she says, even science can't be separated from political and, cl- and cultural concerns. And I'm like, even science? Like, as if science is somehow this... It, it's well, it's the Star Trek thing where we well, raise science above everything else as the the ultimate. It, it's funny because, of course, we live in a time right now where science is basically political. I and mean, let's right. be honest, people just use science as a political club right now. Right. So, yeah, even even from a Vulcan, more detached Vulcan perspective, I think she's right. I mean, yes, you the we can know the science of building an atomic bomb. 
But that's a separate question than should we and what do we do with it if we do? Right. Well, th that's true. That's true. Right. There's the, the just because we can do a thing doesn't mean we necessarily should do a thing uh, in that sense. Insert that. Jeff Goldblum line here about you know, science has never thought about whether. Yeah. Uh, thought so much about whether you, I can't remember the exact line, but the line yeah, about, yeah. you know, they thought about doing sure. it whether or not they should. Right. Yeah. Trina says no on the SB19 data. And so Vulcan, um, so Michael challenges her to Vulcan ritual combat. <laughs> yes. Um, and we have a muck time with Kuna yeah. Califi, only <laughs> this time it's intellectual and it's called Tikal and Ket. Yep. Right. It's it's some it's basically sort of a debate. Yeah, it's a it's a dis, it's, it's like a dissertation defense, <laughs> except you're not it's not a dissertation. I mean, it's sort of like the old Royal Academy of Science things where someone would like someone would get up and give a talk on a particular subject and the members of the academy would uh, would challenge them on it or quiz them on it. And it would be a back mm -hmm. and forth. I suppose it's something like that. But this is much more formalized, ritualized and with consequences. Uh, to it yep. this is i mean it's not to the death but it's it's uh, to the intellectual career death i guess but uh yeah because otherwise because if if she fails in this ritual combat it's like spock's sister's reputation will be forever destroyed on vulcan right yep. so they have what's essentially a, a sort of trial which means she has to have an advocate uh, and nowadays, in the in the the thirty first century, the advocates come from the Coat Malat. Hey, we saw them in Yay. Picard, and uh, Legolas is long gone now. So uh, it turns out that the Coat Malat uh, advocate is Michael's long lost mom. Uh, hence the unification part two. <laughs> Improbable. Yes. Mm. Improbable for a host of reasons. Uh, among them, even if she had joined the co-op Malat as an order. She's like Mrs. Expert on Romulan Vulcan culture now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not just Romulan Vulcan culture, 31st century Romulan Vulcan culture and all of the politics that involves and stuff. And it's like, you're a human right. raised among humans who has only been in this century, as far as we know, for maybe a few years. How does, how do you get this, how do you become such an expert in this kind of trial procedure that you're trusted with being an advocate in it? I get like some might say, oh, she's got conflict of interest. But I think, uh, you yeah. can well, you can yeah. explain it by saying the Mo Coat Malat are with the absolute candor thing. She would if she's a truly a member of that she would have to say I'm conflicted and I can't be a, a objective here or whatever. So mm -hmm. I could see that that overcoming that. But the other thing is like that that she's the one that they would be that they would send because reasons i guess yeah it, it, yeah because it's the plot is convenient for it um yep. well and it throws it it throws in a twist you don't expect because you know we expect the whole season is going to be spent now where's my mom where's my mom where's my mom and all of a sudden oh here she is right where you did not expect her at all right and that's literally why they did it okay so there are three members of this panel that they send. And that's not, that's, that's actually pretty believable. I mm -hmm. mean, we have three judge panels here on earth. Right. So you got a tiebreaker. Yep. Mm -hmm. And of the, th and the three judges represent three plausible segments of society on Navarre. You have a Romulan judge, you have a Vulcan judge, and you have a Romulo Vulcan judge, right. mm -hmm. um, you know, who presumably has mixed ancestry and also red hair, which is the first time we've seen that, I think, yes. in, uh, in someone of this race. So um, they have different attitudes. They clearly come from different places. The The Vulcan purist is the most hardcore hostile to Michael. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Romulan as, is the most pro-Michael. Mm -hmm. And the Romulo Vulcan lady is kind of in the middle. There, There is a conversation between Saru and uh, Tarina uh, about the, the when Navarre left the Federation um, and she she kind of criticizes the Federation as saying in its desire to serve the many, it ignored the needs of the few. And, and Saru kind of points out, wasn't that kind of a Vulcan aphorism way back in the day? The, the, you have to serve the needs of the the, the needs of the many or the, the needs of the many outweigh the, the needs, needs of the few. Right. And uh, and she says, yeah, that that's just an aphorism. <laughs> basically. Yeah. Yeah. She says we've learned to move past aphorisms. Um, by the way, th she also challenges Saru 
uh, when he says that the Federation, even though diminished, is remaining true to its core values. And she's like, is it? Right. So we may get some more development on that front. Well, and it, it's it, it's interesting, too, because with, with the complaints about uh, Burnham's mom being the Quat Malat advocate, how does she know all these issues of Vulcan and Romulan? She's only been here for a few years. Discovery's only been there a few months, maybe. Months, yeah. At most, you know, and it's like, but yet they know everything about, and they've only seen of the Federation headquarters. That's it. They haven't actually seen the outlying star systems or anything like that. They are naively convinced that the Federation in all eras, even a thousand years later, is still going to be at its core, the Federation they want it to have been. And that's, mm-hmm. that's naive. That's frankly, you know, naive. Yeah. Um, I mean, a thousand years from, from now, I mean, heck, we're only 200 something years old, and I'm not sure that the United States is, is, is what it was 200 <laughs> years ago. That's all another discussion. So Burnham's mom says, you know, Kuat Malat, we only go to lost causes, and your, your ritual here is a lost cause. Uh, the, the members of the panel are dedicated to their own logic and facts, not to the uh, objective logic and facts that Burnham thinks they should be. Uh, which would well, be her I, I actually, I, well, I like the way she puts it too. It's you're a lost cause, and yeah. then talks about the different. And it's just kind of like, okay, Burnham, this isn't the she. She didn't take you on as advocate because of the trial. She did because you're the lost cause. Right, right. She's the mom helping. Which they, her which daughter. they play that out, play that out later too. Right. So, so the Vulcan purist wants to dismiss outright. The Romulan wants to explore the possibility that there's a chance they weren't responsible for the burn, um, and the uh, the. The other one straddles the the, <laughs> the middle ground, uh, but so that an attempt to dismiss the trial outright fails, and they have to to go on. Um, and Burnham's mom tells her at this at this point in private, you know, based on what you're not saying to the panel, you can't be trusted. You're not being honest. Because what they're asking for is trust. How do we know that this data won't be misused if we give it over? And right. you might try to do the same thing again. Right. And cause another burn or worse. And so there's this the, the, this conflict that gets set up about what is it? What is it that Burnham needs to overcome? What is the barrier? What is the obstacle in herself? What is it she needs to do to, and say to be trusted? Because Burnham has throughout has shown this tendency to I'm right and I'm going to barrel over everyone else to prove to prove I'm right, even when she's wrong. Right from the very first mm-hmm. episode, frankly. Uh, yeah. Battle of the yeah. Binary Stars. Mom also tells her that the judges are not the only audience in the room. Right. But she doesn't clarify what she means by that. Yes. Meanwhile, Tilly asks Stamets his opinion of her being an acting executive officer. And he says, but he's interrupted before he can give his answer. <laughs> yes. By uh, OO, was it? Uh, yes. Yeah, so yes. It yep. was OO. Um, but he does say that the idea of taking orders from her is deeply weird. So that's kind of funny. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, they do make good points about everyone on the ship outranking her and having more experience. So that they they, mm-hmm. they do they do point it Got out. Got our lantern song. Yeah. Um, it's, when you're executive officer, it's not just standing next to the captain. You know, it's there's work that has to be done. You're the disciplinarian for the ship. And a lot of times the XO represents the captain when the captain isn't there. Right. I Meaning know, yeah. the XO is the captain at that moment. I won't keep hammering that home. <laughs> and there are all the crew evaluations. Yes, yes. The uh, Burnham's mom then points out in the trial that Burnham has a history of insubordination when it suits her ends. And mm-hmm. this is who the Federation sends after a century. I mean, that's really undermine, <laughs> undermines her, like undercuts her. And Burnham gets this great betrayed look on her face, like the teenager who turns to her mom, like, you said what in front of all my yeah. friends? <laughs> <laughs> um, and that as an orphaned human, Burnham is prone to insinuate herself into certain matters of import to fill an emotional void. And that's left her open to manipulation by the Federation. I mean, wow, that. That really yeah. lays it all on the table. Uh, and I'm glad they do that. It, they're, they're, yeah. not, they're not, you know, hinting around it. They really lay out all the flaws. And that I like that kind of writing where they lay out all the flaws in their argument. They, they really set themselves up. And so they have to dig their way out of, the, out of that hole, which they, they, they manage to do here. Um, yeah. You may disagree, but yeah. I, I think they do. No, the, the, I, I, I thought they did. The way they do it is... Um, Michael's mom forces her to be emotionally honest 
in front of the tribunal. Mm -hmm. And this has the effect of forcing fractures in the mm -hmm. tribunal where the, the, the three judges basically all dial up their positions to 11, except the Romulo Vulcan judge who can only dial it up to 5.5. <laughs> um, and, and the Romulan judge says, well, if Vulcan won't release the data, Romulus, Romulans will. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this threatens and, and we'd been told by Trina at the beginning of the episode that this is extremely sensitive data in Vulcan society politically. And now we see the factions and, and breaking apart over that data. And this could irreparably harm society on Navarre. And so rather than um, rather than harm one of the founding members of the Federation and ruin any chance of getting it back and just hurting it on its own, Michael decides to suddenly realize, oh, we could get this data another way. Thank you. I withdraw my request. <laughs> right. Yeah. And but but in so doing, she impresses Trina, who is the other audience that mom was referring to, and realizes, okay, she is she does have Navarre's best interests at heart, because mm -hmm. rather than pursue getting the data from the Romulans, which would fracture Vulcan society, she cares more about. I have to say Navarre now to keep the two races, yep. mm -hmm. you know, off together. But she cares more about the unity of Navarre than she does about getting this data she wants. Right. And that may, is what makes her trustworthy in Trina's eyes of receiving the data. The true heir of Spock's legacy. In that sense. Yeah. But, but of course, they have to have the epic speech by Michael Burnham about how important being unified for the sake of unity is and all mm -hmm. that, you know, because it has to be Michael Burnham giving that speech. Well, it's Star Trek. We have to speechify uh, <laughs> in order to drive the point home. There is a line that mom gives uh, that I want to discuss where she says duty is there so you can continue to pursue your happiness and joy, uh, your happiness and joy is there. So you have something real to fight for. And I'm like, I don't think duty mm. is for the pursuit of She's happiness. She's talking from the perspective of a screenwriter. Yeah. It's duty is there so we can pursue truth, right? Well, duty, mm. duty there ultimately is so that, you know, in the case of like, say, a starship is so that you can do your mission. Right. But I think in the, in the more abstract sense, like we have a duty yeah. or a vocation. Our vocation is yeah. not to pursue happiness because sometimes happiness is at odds with the, the mm -hmm. moral, the mm -hmm. right, the correct. She. So this is going to depend on the type of utilitarian calculus you're doing. <laughs> okay. If 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 you mean hedonism, if that's what you mean by pleasure or joy, then yeah, our duty isn't there for the sake of that. No. But duty promotes human flourishing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you mm -hmm. do your duty, that promotes human flourishing, and you can refer to human flourishing as happiness or joy or whatever you want. And so doing our duty is oriented towards our own good. And we do have a vocation to seek happiness and to seek the good, but they're the same thing. Okay. So it, it pursuing pursuing your duty will on balance lead to happiness. Where it falls apart is Happiness is not there to give you something to fight for unless you're a writer <laughs> who needs the characters to be happy so they have something to fight for. Right. Because right. Right. you always got to show the Shire before you show Mordor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and let, let's be honest, there are times where you're doing, doing your responsibility, your duty, is it going to lead to happiness for you? It's going to lead to difficulty. It's going to lead to... Sometimes, Sometimes you know, pain and yeah. suffering, you know? Yeah. And, but ultimately, like, like Jimmy said, it's for human flourishing as a whole, just maybe not yours. Did the, for you, did it, did the, the phrase pursue, hap, pursue your happiness invo evoke the declaration and independence, you know, life, liberty, we, like and Jefferson wrote life, liberty, with pursuit of life, liberty, the pursuit of uh, happiness. It kind of evoked a little of that for me. I thought that was interesting. I, I think it kind of, I think it kind of does, but I, I would be surprised if it was unintentional. Yeah. Um. You know, you, since the, since they're not going to say flat out, you know, we have to do our duty before God and country. 
right. you know, with the emphasis on God. They got to have something they can put in in place of God. And of course, that's happiness, joy, however you want to put it. Right. So they got to have something to throw in there. Self-fulfillment. Yeah. 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 Well, it turns out that uh, Vulcan President Trina is uh, impressed enough by what she heard to trust Burnham with the data after all. So I don't know. I almost feel I feel like it would have been better for the overall story if she didn't ever get the data and Burnham had to go work to get more data otherwise. But on the other hand, you've only got so many episodes in the season. And and the the rest of the season would be a black box hunt is basically what it would end up being. Yeah. So Trina also has the hots for Saru, clearly. Yes. You could like that Vulcan, the Vulcan dispassionate. She's still you could tell there was chemistry. She's flirting with him. (laughs) Yeah. Come back and visit us sometime. So the, uh, the meanwhile, we have the, the scene thing we, we mentioned before where the bridge crew surprises Tilly by telling her to say yes to becoming XO. Um, and that's also where Burnham says she's not leaving. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and of course, Tilly's got to get Burnham's blessing because Burnham is so perfect. <laughs> and if this were a musical, the say yes would have been a musical number. <laughs> just, yeah. just tell it, say it. It was close uh, enough. It was close enough. Um, it, 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 Oh, I just so this is the episode where at least at present now I've tried to be open to every every season of Discovery. I have not uh, hated Discovery. I've appreciated many things about it. But as of this episode, I said to myself, we now have three Mary Sue's on this ship Mm. and the whole season this season is too emotionally touchy feely. Mm -hmm. It is emotion driven paint by numbers writing and it's introspective, emotional navel gazing because we always have to have these, these finales of, um, of, of like raw emotion instant, which are never triumph. Mm -hmm. It's always the same set of emotions that we're cycling through over and over again between some kind of tragic vulnerability loss like we had with Michael at the end of the previous episode where she gets demoted or affirmation of someone who's emotionally needy like we have at the end of this episode with Tilly. Yeah. And it's we're just bathing in this sea of kind of wishy washy emotionalism and i hate it Mm -hmm. i it's like come on this isn't kirk this isn't picard this isn't cisco this is mark it's not even archer this is or janeway Mm -hmm. this is markedly different than anything we've come before it is so driven by vulnerability and by emotional vulnerability and the need for affirmation that it's it's like I and I I hate to say this, but it has been observed that younger writers tend to go today, not in the past, but today tend to go in this direction because of millennial culture. Mm-hmm. And I can't help wondering if that and the wokeness in Hollywood is what's producing this writing, because this is just not what uh, Star Trek classically delivers to us. It's it, this yeah. reads like bad fanfic as evidence that it's we've got three Mary Sue's on the ship and Mary Sue's are characters that emerge from fanfic. When you look at the totality of Discovery so far, the three seasons, universally everyone agrees the second season was the better of the of the three seasons. What's different about that season is you have the Pike. You got Pike yeah. and Spock and number one and a more classic type of Star Trek. That it, yeah. mm-hmm. it really evokes the original series and TNG and DS9 very strongly. And that, that worked better. They didn't do all of this emotional navel gazing wallowing that we get. And I, I, yeah, I agree. I mean, again, I like much of this episode. I like Vulcan episodes anyway. I like the Vulcan stuff. Yeah, I liked the Vulcan part. <laughs> yeah, I, I really disliked the Tilly is EXO thing. And I really disliked the emotional wallowing that 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 as a result and so yeah i i agree with the, in that respect it's i'm having trouble with it hopefully it's going to give hope for strange new worlds when that comes out because mm-hmm. that is going to be pike and spock and and number one right um 
that's why lower decks actually work so well because right. it was a very similar it was a similar more traditional star trek with some pretty good humor overlaid on right. it and, there's no room for know, the uh, the silly emotional wallowing you know that that sort of stuff in in that but it's scene. just yeah. well and, and of course that, that closing scene i was just thinking about this this is yet another of the togetherness of the, the togetherness of this ship you know <laughs> right. but the ship is so together that everybody's gonna stand there and tell her to to just suck it up and do it you know right so we do end the episode with uh, Burnham telling Book that she's not leaving the ship, you know, unspoken with him. Um, and he says, he says that doesn't, he doesn't know what that means for him because she feels like home to him. It's like, like it means he's going to join Starfleet in a future episode. <laughs> yeah. Yes. He's at least <laughs> going to stick around anyway. Or he's uh, at least going to be the recurring character that she's going to fly in every once in a while and we'll see him. Right. Right. Uh, and that wraps up the the this episode the next one is what's the next one um i forget what they called the next uh, where the the next episode is titled um i don't have I that even look. in front of me but uh so that that's going to be next um any any other final thoughts on this episode one one little note when the uh i was kind of wondering about this and when they when they did the uh spore jump uh the nacelles do reattach yes yeah see i can't i, I can't help now that they've detached the nacelles, wanting to see the center section spin and just lose them. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, forgot to hit that switch. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to end up somewhere halfway across the galaxy with no nacelles. Darn well, that's it. right, because they can just spore jump. And they, they don't need nacelles to do uh, impulse. So, <laughs> uh, Jimmy, any final thoughts? Nah. All right, let's go to our feedback. Uh, last time we talked about uh, the episode Scavengers. We had a comment from uh, our friend kelly brown on facebook she wrote for the most part i enjoyed this episode but it did have its flaws adira the miri sue is really annoying i'm thinking of starting to refer to her as marissa and she links to a uh, uh article on the really great website tvtropes.com which has mm -hmm. all the tv tropes you made to a marissa picard uh <laughs> trope uh, oh. yeah i, I want to explain it. you have to uh, we'll put the link in the show notes and you'll have to go check it out uh she says uh the panel uh, meaning us was correct that two mary so susan one show could spell disaster for the universe the solution is obvious they will need to fight to the death as the prophecy foretells <laughs> neither can live while the other survives there can be only one yep. <laughs> yes and now uh, we got three so it's gonna get even better that it will get even better uh she says i really like the admiral uh, meaning vance i was disappointed in saru i've really been enjoying him this season but at the end he was like space ward cleaver telling michael how disappointed he was in her picard or cisco would never do that <laughs> they would give them heck and then punish them so yeah uh so that's and that's our Good. feedback so thank you kelly for that we, we obviously i think we're in agreement <laughs> with you and yeah, exactly all right so let's wrap up by thanking our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of star trek including frank l penelope w jonathan l pam and james m their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of star trek and all the shows at starquest you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So what, that's it from us. What did you think of this episode, Unification 3? You can send us feedback on the show at sqpn.com slash trek or our Facebook page at facebook.com slash starquest media or send an email to trek at sqpn.com. And we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the next episode, which is actually entitled The Sanctuary. Until then, Father Corey Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Thank you, Dom. Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thank you, and since Vulcans and Romulans have now had reunification, live long and prosper, and Jolan True. <laughs> and once again, <laughs> I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest, and remember, say yes. <laughs>